Welcome to episode 304 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? All right, Rob, how are you doing? Doing okay. Uh, don't think I have any complaints. How about you? Any, uh, any news going on? Oh, I thought you were asking me if I had any complaints. <laughs> I mean, um, do you? <laughs> I mean, there's, I'm sure there's things I could complain about. Uh, but it has been officially announced that I am scheduled to do a workshop at Indice Tech Town. So that's oh, nice. official now. Um, and just as an aside, because we don't have it in our show notes to discuss, I just saw yesterday that CPPCon has announced their call for papers. Oh, very good. Yeah. So talking about conferences and starting to return to normal in some ways. Yeah. And you know, on that note of CVPCon, do we yet know if it's going to be a virtual, in-person, or some kind of hybrid? Has they They've been mentioning yet? hybrid for a while okay. now. Okay. Hybrid is the plan. Cool. OK, well, at the top of every episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we saw this tweet from Sean Parent and uh, saying he's excited to announce that Dave Abrams is joining Adobe and we are restarting Adobe Software Technology Lab. Wow. And uh, someone then tweeted at us, uh, Christoph Havasi, saying, CPCast, want to invite Sean for an update. And it certainly has been a very long time since we had Sean Parent on the show. It has. Uh, I don't recall if this is something we talked about with him, the Software Technology Lab. Is that something he used to be a part of and they're now restarting? Yes, it definitely would have come up because like his uh, alternate futures implementation, I think, is on the ST Lab GitHub and there's a few other projects on there. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it came up in some regard, but I don't know if we talked about it specifically on the show. OK, well, yeah, we should definitely reach out to Sean and Dave, maybe both of them or at least one of them to come on and, and talk about the type of stuff they're working on there. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cppcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Patrick Obara. Patrick is a Poland-based polyglot programmer. During his 13 years of professional experience, he worked on various C++-based projects like Opera Browser, middleware software for Nokia networking products, and recently on VoIP software products for Metaswitch slash Microsoft. He's also a maintainer of several open source projects and drive-by contributor to many more. Aside from C++, he enjoys programming in C, Rust, Python, OCaml, and even weirder languages like Prolog. Patrick, welcome to the show. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I, I like the categorization of yourself here as a drive-by contributor to many open source projects. What does that look like? <clears throat> Well, whenever, basically, whenever I, I see, I have some kind of gripe with any project. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, if the gripe is big enough that I actually I want to use that project, and not switch to to any any other one, uh, I try to compile it and try to see. Hey, maybe it is easy to fix. Maybe it's not fixed. So uh, through this process, I actually contributed to quite many. <laughs> projects and learn the way to, to the, usually the hardest part is actually to go through the uh, process of learning how to contribute to a given project. For a GitHub right. based project, it's, it's usually the same, but uh, when it comes to when you have mailing list or some other system or SVN or something, it might be more difficult. So for many projects, you've just submitted one or two patches to fix some issue and then moved on yeah. with your life, basically. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Sometimes five, sometimes 10, sometimes 15. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually one or two. You know, that's better than what I do, because I feel like I often just like patch around it locally or look to see if I can find a branch that has my solution or something. And I don't actually go the next step of trying to help contribute back to the project when I see something like that. I guess it depends on the situation. I've done both, but. More often, I just hack around it locally. <laughs> yeah, I'm having uh, quite standardized the process of, of uh, publishing patches and, and submitting changes. Like GitHub helps, but right. it's a bit of double-edged sword when it comes to various, uh, for example, uh, maintainers time. Right. right. 
Okay, well, Patrick, we got a couple of news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking more about the work you've done on DOSBox, okay? Sure. All right, so this first one is from the Visual C++ blog, and it is Format in Visual Studio 2019, version 16.10. Uh, <laughs> and if you have not used Format before, uh, this is a really good post just going over how to use uh, std format as it exists in C20, which is now fully into Visual Studio 2019, the latest version, which I did update to the other day. I haven't had a chance to try to use format yet. I haven't tried any of the vendor provided ones yet. I've only used, yeah, lib format standalone. But nice to see that uh, you know, even more C20 is making it into uh, the different compilers already. I just comment, Rob, that you said std format. Mm -hmm. I just had someone comment on Funked. YouTube. What's that? Should I be saying std funked? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I just had someone comment on my YouTube channel. They said, in 20 years of development, I've never heard anyone say std. And I did that in my YouTube channel recently. Um, I don't tend to. I tend to only use std if I'm at a conference and there's a bunch of other people around me also saying that instead of saying std. Anyhow, just a random aside. Yeah, I think I, I guess sometimes switch between the two. I hadn't thought about it that much. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next thing we have is a post from Herb Sutter's blog, and this is a, another uh, virtual uh, standards meeting trip report uh, for summer 2021, and they did vote in. A few more uh, C++ 23 features. He's got a, a short list of what's gone in. And he also did put in an update that they do have planned what might be the first uh, tentative face-to-face -face meeting since the pandemic started, which is uh, currently scheduled for February 2022, which still seems so far off, but we're, we're moving through 2021 pretty fast. 2021 is moving way too fast, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there any other any of the um, papers that went in you wanted to highlight, Jason or Patrick? I uh, just think it's worth maybe commenting that if you you look over the last several of these standards meeting uh, trip reports from Herb, it seems to be increasingly clear that we're not going to get any very large features in C plus plus twenty three at this rate. It it seems that way. I mean, there's always the chance that they approve a lot in February twenty twenty two, but that is the like feature freeze of C plus plus twenty three. Right. If you don't get a lot in, then then you're absolutely right. C plus plus twenty three is probably going to be fairly small more of a like a bug fix yeah maybe, and maybe we'll get concurrency it looks like possibly there is some progress on that but none of the other okay. features that i was hoping for like pattern matching we haven't seen anything about that maybe someone will comment after they listen to this episode and say that pattern matching is actually moving along quite well but i would be surprised from what we've seen yeah i feel like it's been a while since we've kind of talked to anyone working on standards proposals in a while. So I have, don't have as much tracking on like what's been going on there. Maybe we should uh, you know, do another update on the type of progress they've been making. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing uh, we have is a fourth of four part series on painless C++ code routines. And this is all on Medium. And it looks like, I don't, I think I read through the first three parts, but um, this fourth part is uh, pretty long, but looks like it really gets into uh, how to make coroutines a little bit easier to work with. I really just wanted to highlight the series of articles because I had someone else point them out to me mm -hmm. that it's part four of painless coroutines when each one is like a novella. Yeah. It's so. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate what the author is doing, but clearly it seems that coroutines out of the box are not so painless to use. It certainly seems that way. Patrick, have you had a chance to uh, try our coroutines yet? 
not here. And I think it will be still a little bit of time. Right. Right now, right now I'm uh, more concerned with uh, having C17 and 20 widely available. And only after that, I will switch to using those standards. And yes, it was 20 still. It's not got the future. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I think we've talked about DOSBox a couple times before on the show, but could you start off, Patrick, with telling our listeners a little bit more about what DOSBox is, if they haven't heard of it before or aren't too familiar with it? Yeah, so <clears throat> DOSBox is uh, a low-level emulator of x86-based machines. So that is a great general description. Mm, and so, so let's explain step by step. So what does low level mean? Low level uh, emulator. Uh, it means that CPU is emulated completely in software, uh, as opposed to being uh, using some virtual uh, special, special instructions provided by uh, Intel architectures to, to make it faster. Now it's completely in software, okay. uh, which makes it uh, more portable, easier to, to port to, to different operating systems and different architectures, and that's the benefit. Uh, there are, of course, some uh, features to make uh, emulation faster uh, on, on popular architectures, but uh, even if there is some very weird platform that has very weird requirements, uh, you can always fall back to a slower path and it will work. That's how many ports actually started. Um, so that's, that's the, the most... <laughs> Uh, precise uh, description. However, there are some uh, high-level emulation features in there, like emulating some parts of graphic stack and uh, sound, etc. But that's beside the point for now. But what's important about DOSBox, because it's a quite unique uh, project compared to other x86 emulators, because there are plenty of such projects out there. It has a set of unique features. Uh, it is Combina very unique combination of features uh, that make, make it very attractive for certain use cases. That is, first of all, it has built-in uh, DOS-like shell, which makes uh, it easy to actually run the programs, right? So when user actually wants to start some program, run something, they don't need to install MS-DOS 6.22 in some uh, image somewhere, you know, just starting those boxes enough. There is those like environment in there with uh, plenty of uh, those commands, not all of them, but use very usable uh, subset. Uh, another unique feature is ability to mount directories uh, from native host file system as a virtual DOS drive, right? So uh, that means that uh, no images are required. There are uh, unlike most emulators have uh, some kind of ROMs or, uh, for example, emulators for NES or other consoles have um, games distributed as ROM images nowadays, right? So those games were never installed. For those, for all the PC games, the situation is different. Uh, CDs and floppies were only used as medium for installation. So when user has old floppy images or old CD images, they need to be installed somewhere. And because uh, we have those shell out of the box and we can install directly on to the to, to host file system, it looks like installation to the file system. It's a little bit similar to Wine's prefixes. If apart from it. <clears throat> Another feature is possibility of scripting emulator startup. So mm. uh, on the, in the very beginning, uh, user can write a configuration file uh, where specific set of those commands are being uh, evaluated in, on, on start. So when every DOS game is different, <laughs> every DOS game has its own quirks and, and its own special uh, toggles and uh, bugs and other uh, other things that are need to be checked and switched and, and, uh, and toggled. Uh, so using those box, this, this can be completely scripted. So when, oh, and uh, another, it's completely free. And comp it's completely free libre software, which means uh, 
there is uh, no requirement for uh, obtaining some ROMs from old hardware, uh, some firmware images, and, and, and dumping them in, uh, with the game. No, it, it works out of the box uh, just like that. And can emulate uh, plenty of old hardware, like uh, old uh, VGA cards, or old graphic cards, old uh, sound cards, different types, uh, including some weird ones. Uh, yeah, so that's important. And because of this combination of features, uh, it is basically can be treated as a run, uh, as mo runtime for modern operating systems for running all the DOS software. So it behaves basically as runtime. Uh, Thus, it is very attractive uh, project for companies that are uh, try to, to release their old games uh, nowadays on Steam or on GOG or somewhere else uh, because they don't need to do that much. Like they only need to prepare the configuration file, start a configuration file, uh, dump the insta installed files somewhere and distribute them however they like, however they prefer. And there are no ROM, exactly, there are no ROMs, everything is uh, GPL free, so they can distribute it. It's like uh, another big group of users is game, of course, gamers, because uh, especially older gamers who have memories of playing those games in the 80s and 90s and right. uh, want to relive those, those, those memories. Uh, because there are a lot of those games, lots and lots, of, thousands and thousands of those games, and uh, many popular ones were ported to modern operating systems or are supported by projects like Scam VM, which is an excellent project. Uh, but it's only a, a tiny, tiny portion of available soft, of, of software that was written for DOS. Uh, yeah, so gamers who want to relieve the past and uh, somewhat a similar group, game archivists, game historians, people who are actively, uh, whose the, their hobby is to preserve the, those games. So they, they, they sometimes go to very great lengths to, to obtain some old legal copy of uh, of some game from mid 80s and then uh, preserve it properly and uh, make sure that all the instructions are uh, are there in, in digital form etc so for them it is very important to have uh, ability to quickly uh, switch different feature hardware features emulate maybe diff this card maybe different graphics card maybe uh, maybe uh, trim the size size of emulated drive, hard drive because if it's too, too big, some games are going to fail. Mm. This, this era software is not very good <laughs> compared <laughs> to modern times. Uh, so yeah, that's very important for, for them to have, to have this ability to, to test good. Uh, and there are also other use cases like. Uh, people who want to run some old non-gaming software to dump old projects or recover data from old databases or uh, connect to some uh, old physical big hardware, for example. There, are, there is a group oh. of users who are using a DOS box to connect to the CNC machines from the 80s uh, because mm. this is the only way to run uh, drivers for those CNC machines. Nowadays. How did they tie the do they enough. use like a USB they, parallel they, port they, or something? Or? Uh, there's a serial port emulation in those box and it can go through to the uh, cost operating system and they are probably using some kind of USB, exact USB oh, okay. uh, device to um, to generate serial <laughs> outputs for for, uh, for their machines. Okay. That I, actually I had no idea it could do that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, or there are also people who run old BBSs, for example, because there is uh, <laughs> uh, old networking features emulation like IP IPX uh, network and various others. Uh, even some uh, some users who, who were asking a little bit weird questions, for example, I hope it's not true that those box is running in any hospitals or something like that, but <laughs> there know. were, I heard questions about these kind of scenarios, I hope they are not true. Uh, oil rigs as well. Oh, wow. So, so that's uh, gives a little bit of uh, spoiler about 
how worried we are about not introducing any regressions. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, is um, does DOSBox emulate any particular PC, or is it just like a generic PC from the 90s? It's not like trying to be a Tandy or trying to be a, a whatever, a Dell or something. Uh, it tries to emulate generic PC, but mm -hmm. it's kind of switch. There are uh, those PCs, those clones, PC clones were quite similar to each other, so uh, it is possible to switch. So, for example, it is possible to switch from a uh, generic to 286 or 386 based machine to 10 d or PC Junior. Uh, there is an ability to uh, load uh, cartridges from PC, for PC Junior. Because oh, okay. Has ability to distribute games on, on cartridges. Uh, it is possible to, confi to configure the runtime for using Sound Blaster, which is by the, which is the default, different types of, types of Sound Blaster. Uh, uh, also, uh, Goose, this Gravis Ultrasound, which is very important for some uh, use cases and for some people, or demo scene, for example. The, or the, the demo scene is another group of users, which uh, yeah, it's important to actually run them. <laughs> so oh, right. The demo scene productions somehow. Uh, and those uh, were more likely than, than, than usual to use uh, Gravis Ultrasound cards, which were not very, very popular. Okay. So what is your uh, relationship with how you've been contributing to the DOSBox project? Do you want to tell us about how you got involved? Okay, so uh, I'm maintainer, not, not maintainer of the DOSBox project itself. I am right. maintainer of the uh, fork called DOSBox Staging. Okay. And uh, this project, uh, let's <laughs> roll back historically. Sure. Before actually uh, starting my involvement with DOSBox, in think, right, I was working on a different project called Boxtron. Uh, this uh, Boxtron was, is, it's, the project is still exists, of course, uh, is a tool for running DOS games that are distributed via Steam uh, in a nat native new version of DOSBox on Linux. So, okay. So oh, wow. uh, some game distributors who are dumping their uh, archives on, on Steam, they usually bundle with some very old and very deprecated version of DOSBox. And the, for example, version from 15 years ago sometimes. And it is sometimes problematic to, to run those versions on modern machines. And Boxtron was a project to make it easy, right? So, uh, okay, I want to run this old game it was. It is officially distributed on Steam, uh, but I want to run them in new version of those books. Okay, so after installing and configuring the only uh, box drum inside Steam, the only thing the user needs to do is just hit play, and box drum takes over uh, uh, running the game, reconfigures it for modern version of those books. Uh, runs it it's in, in native Linux version of DOSBox instead of some Wine or, or other compatibility tools, oh, and goodness. the and the results were pretty pretty good pretty fine. Uh, a lot of users enjoyed that version because uh, configuring DOSBox is can be a chore. It, it can be quite difficult. I just just do a quick step back. You said if I heard right that some of the old DOS games distributed on Steam, if you run them on Linux. Is going to run DOSBox through Wine on Linux exactly. to play the game. Exactly. Okay, that, that does not sound ideal. <laughs> not at all. Uh, those were those are mostly games that were, that were never distributed on Linux in the first place because right. uh, sure. Steam has uh, the feature called Proton for running Windows old Windows not, not every Windows game on right. Linux uh, via via Wine. So that's and, Steam doing its automated. Compatibility yeah. layer. Okay, but that happens only because the original uh, distributor did not care to actually release a version of those game using native Linux version of those books on Steam. Right. So yeah, that's the workaround for this problem. And when working on Boxtron, I was uh, learning about all, all the quirks <laughs> and all, all the, the problems that are usually happening when when. Uh, what needs to be done to actually properly configure some old game for a given situation and how to solve this problem. That maybe there are 
to this place and it does not work correctly, so how do I solve that? And, and Boxstrom was implementing workaround after workaround after workaround for, for some features, that, uh, for some problems that, that I was experiencing. And at some point I ran out of workarounds. <laughs> uh, that is, it was no longer possible to, to, to fix certain things uh, just by, by changing the configuration because there was literally a bug inside DOS box. So I switched to, to, to looking inside and uh, learning how, how can I fix that, deploy my one or two fixes and go on my merry way and continue working on Boxing. And the big problem in there was switch from SDL1 to SDL2. Mm. Because SDL1 is very old library. Uh, and it is still being used by upstream DOSBox. And it is causing a lot of issues, at least on Linux. On other operating system as well, uh, but on Linux it was especially bad. Uh, issues like with input, uh, literally not working keyboard, <laughs> for example. Mm. Uh, or issues with uh, output when there are two displays attached to, to the PC. It, starting DOSBox took over both displays at the same time and stretched the image somehow. And those problems were all the, all of those problems were simply, could be simply fixed by moving to SDL2. Uh, so I was a little surprised why SDL2 was not used after 10 years or something. Yeah, it's been a long time since SDL1 was maintained, I feel like. Yes, SDL1 is not maintained at all anymore. And okay. uh, all the development moved to SDL2. And, uh, but it's, it is still a big problem. That there are a lot of games, older games and older software, which only used SDL1 and never moved to SDL2 because the migration was not trivial. But right. It, uh, it, migration was not trivial because uh, SDL2 is a much better project. It, it has much better API and uh, it improved all, all, all many issues in original uh, library, but that required breaking a lot of things. Well, anyway, back to that. So I tried to fix, uh, fix the issues that I was experiencing. Uh, and I noticed that I'm not, of course, not the only one. There were uh, the problem with uh, DOSBox was that the last major version was released 10 years ago. Right. So, and the development didn't stop completely. It's still ongoing on very slow pace. But uh, community contributions moved much faster. So there's an extremely long backlog of items that some people started developing and uh, tried to make uh, push it upstream, but Maintainers of those box did not have enough time and uh, enough, um, you know, basically time to do to, to budget in. And this backlog was really very, very long. And what did, was not helping was that the project is in SVN still, uh, which is rather exception nowadays. The right. community wanted to move to Git, but upstream prefers to stay in SVN for various reasons. Okay. So I said, instead of complaining on the forums or something like that, I would actually try to solve the problem. Uh, so <laughs> therefore, I uh, migrated very carefully. I migrated all the history, uh, preserving all the changes, uh, not dumped the history, but preserve, preserve all the history that was in SVN, decorated with nice git tags. Uh, I can take prepared. a while. Yeah. Uh, preserving uh, the history and your move from I SVN actually did it a lot of, I did, the same thing many times earlier for at work and for other mm. projects. So I had already scripts prepared exactly for the thing that needs to be done. So okay. the project was quite quick. Good. Uh, and after some deliberation, named the, the repository DOSBox staging to, to suggest that, okay, this is, I am not trying to fork DOSBox. I am not, I am trying to be a staging area <laughs> for people who are waiting uh, to, to help with, with, with resolving this backlog of items. Right. Uh, because there are hundreds and hundreds of patches that are, and features that are developed and some are forgotten already. Uh, some were, are quite good, but were never never finished because nobody reviewed them. And therefore they cannot be merged as is, but someone needs to do review. 
and resolving this would require, of course, having nice CI, having some tests, having uh, ability to easily build on all operating systems. And unfortunately, those mod project were was lacking all of those. Mm -hmm. So uh, initially, and uh, other uh, developers from uh, Vogons Forum, Vogons Forum is a place where, where those blocks are being uh, developed, uh, joined me, which is pretty quickly they were very enthusiastic about uh, move to Git because someone actually did it instead of complaining and asking again and again. Uh, and for some time, we tried to go with this process when new uh, patches were staging in my repository. And after they were good enough, and uh, upstream maintainers decided, okay, that's that's fine. They we were trying to merge them into SVN, into upstream, into SVN mm -hmm. repository. Uh, well, not after a little bit, after some time, it didn't work so well. Uh, mostly because for our Git repository, for staging repository, it was quite easy to learn to changes because of CI, the, uh, a little bit of tests because we are still adding tests. Uh, uh, rewritten build system, some bugs fixed and other areas addressed. So for us, it was quite easy to land new changes. But for upstream, it was not so easy. So the backlog, instead of going smaller, it actually started to grow <laughs> because okay. more, more people were interested in, in uh, presenting their patches to us. So after some, some time, uh, we started decided that now it, we can follow this way. Uh, and DOSBox staging turned from a uh, staging repository, which had no readme back then even, into a soft fork of the project. So we are uh, regularly still syncing up with upstream because oh. there are some uh, regular important changes, uh, especially in uh, for various game quicks and specific programs. There are important changes still landing, landing in there. Uh, so we are regularly mer merging some changes back into the spoke staging. Uh, but otherwise, we are much more liberal about uh, adding new features. Uh, we completely rewrote the build system, for example, uh, adding tests, uh, moving from old C++ to newer version. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And also breaking some feet. Break. We also broke or removed some features that we thought were not important anymore nowadays. Mm. So, for example, we removed uh, support for OS2 operating system. Mm. So, for being able to run OS2 in DOSBox, or but from uh, being able to run DOSBox on OS2. This the the second one from okay. DOSBox on OS2, which is nobody runs OS2 really <laughs> <laughs> anymore. Right. Uh, just hobbyists and yeah, a few people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, this operating, it was dropped in 2006 or 2008, something like that. Yeah. But OS2 or, for example, on Windows 98, because there, there were people, there are people who like to run Windows 98, those box inside, and then uh, disk image and then windows 98 inside <laughs> and then those oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there are people who enjoy these kind of things but i don't think it's really necessary to, for us to, to, to uh, keep the project <laughs> uh, back and not have for example just 14. right yeah so uh, i guess yeah. that answers a, a question that i just had is c plus plus 14 is what you're moving to we already moved to c++ Move to okay uh, yeah uh, and I hope in a few months we are going to move to C17. The only okay. thing uh, holding us back is that one of the platforms that we want to support does not have uh, C17 uh, standard, li standard library because it was based on Ubuntu 12.04. Okay. Correctly. But mm. I think it's not going, uh, the problem is already resolved and we probably can safely. Move to C17. Was that like a version of Raspbian or something that's holding you back? Like, I'm just guessing here. Uh, Steam Runtime. Old Steam oh. Runtime. Oh, okay, uh, since okay. then, uh, Steam Runtime, there was a new version of Steam Runtime uh, released literally several months ago. Actually, I'm not sure if it was released or is it still in beta, but 
it's there and it's much newer and much better and much, much improved. But the old original version of Steam Runtime uh, is not able to reliably run C17 projects. Reliably, I like that. <laughs> okay, so. So in addition to uh, upgrading to C++14, um, have you made other changes to, to modernize DOSBox or using like static analysis against the code base? Yeah, plenty, like plenty. Uh, so first of all, we started fixing warnings. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the, the, the most basic thing that, that, that developers can do to significantly improve uh, the, the ex developer experience, which is Developer experience is important for open source projects, really. Right. And uh, to make it easier to review the code. So if there are no warnings, it's it's much easier. To, the reviewer doesn't need to remember about, oh, do I need to check about this and this and this. If there are no warnings, then that's it. The host of, of potential issues uh, is already addressed. So uh, we implemented gating in our, C first of all, we created CI based on GitHub Actions, because it just happened that GitHub Actions uh, arrived in, uh, was released as beta at roughly the same time. So we started using it. <clears throat> and uh, put in place gating so that we can change things, but not a single change that, <laughs> that we introduce cannot raise the limit of warnings. It can only go down. Mm -hmm. This hard gating, we simply do not allow uh, any pull requests that make the other new warnings. And uh, gradually we started adding new uh, category of warnings to this gating. So the number of warnings went down and down and down. And several thousands warnings later, we are not clean. <laughs> right? And it's, uh, it is really an improvement to, to see the clean build from the beginning to the end. And, and uh, also incremental build, that's, that's important. I just had a curiosity, as you've been um, reducing the warning load, have real bugs been fixed or most, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, sometimes those bugs were not really that, that, that big or uh -huh. those were potential bugs talking into code, but even warning, even simple uh, warning fixes can, can uh, not maybe uh, indicate exactly the line of code where the, the bug is present, but when the developer starts looking, oh, why someone wrote this like that? Or, oh, maybe this warning is like this, but maybe this is something different. Or maybe this is copied, code copied from some other place, and this does not look right. And we actually had uh, quite weird emulation issues fixed by, only by uh, looking at warnings that were uh, indicated by awesome. hmm. And we, are, of course, run it through GCC, CLang, and uh, MSVC. Running MSVC on CI was a little bit problematic, but it works and it's very uh, beneficial. Uh, so, uh, after that, we also added static analysis uh, because the same. Just like warnings, static analysis is, I think it is really great. Uh, all, maybe not all, but the vast majority of, of static analyzers are very high quality products and they, every single one of them indicate a little bit different issues. And uh, some have high uh, false positive ratio, some have, some have lower false positive ratio, but it's important to at least look at those issues because if automatic system is uh, confused, about the code and the person looking at that code later on is probably going to be confused as well. I like that attitude. <laughs> yeah, and uh, with the same gating, right? We are not allowing any any new static analysis issues to show up, which means that, yeah, sometimes we, some feature may be longer in review or will be developed uh, later, but hey, we are open source, we don't have deadlines, we don't care. We care more about quality then. Uh, than about uh, delivering it a little bit earlier. Uh, yeah, and out of stat static analysis tools, we definitely use uh, Silang Static Analyzer, which is uh, doesn't report so many issues for us, but 
uh, it has very low uh, false positive ratio right. and indicated actual problematic code areas and actual buffer overflows and bugs and uh, honestly uh, it is so easy to run Silent static analyzer uh, on CI that I don't really want to, to, to work on, on C++ projects that don't have it integrated into CI. So really, are you you're distinguishing yep. that from Clang tidy, right? You're talking about like C, like now Clang what dash analyze or something like that, or are you talking about Clang tidy, or are we talking about? Uh, no, uh, I think tidy is to, to to automatically fix some issues, but. Uh, let me check. Okay, anyway, I don't sure. remember because even uh, that's fine. I moved to Amazon and. Uh, as I did, we also use uh, a Coverity static analyzer, mm -hmm. which was a little bit painful for some time, uh, at times to use, uh, and detects completely different host of issues than Synax static analyzer. Uh, but it's also very good. It's also very good, uh, and also detected a number of speci specifically buffer, buffer overflow issues in, in our code. Wow or indicated code that was uh, smelly a little bit as, uh, because we after looking in the context uh, okay maybe right now there was no the actual bug was not present here at the moment but if some other pull request change line earlier line later uh, then yeah that would be a bug so, that's interesting uh, also, PV, PVS, uh, we used PVS for a year, and it was another diff completely different set of, uh, of, of issues were detected. Uh, what is very nice about PVS, it detects, uh, it also suggests certain improvements. So, for example, mm -hmm. when uh, oh, in here you can uh, avoid, speed up this thing by using uh, pre incrementation instead of post incrementation in here and here and here or in here you can simply compare to null instead of uh, invoking some method which will be slower because this might be virtual method and so on so on so on pvs is good at this kind of things so uh, the quality is in, by using pvs quality got improved but by maybe micro optimization here micro optimization there uh, some actual code quality issue in here and there and it's, it's, it's very, very interesting, and uh, yeah, we are using that for a year, and recently we successfully uh, got the renewal of our of our license, on free license, mm. from PPS. So that's that's great. And uh, some time ago, we started using LGTM.com, which is oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, this is a project which has very different approach to, 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 to static analysis and it was very interesting uh, i'm not sure how it works in detail uh, but i think they are uh, after doing static analysis they are filtering it by uh, some machine learning to decide okay is, if this is false positive or not hmm. and the result is that detects much fewer issues but the issues that are detected uh, have very high uh, a very low uh, false positive ratio, right. very, very low. Wow. And it also has uh, ability to, to compare projects within projects and score the project uh, as, <laughs> okay, the code quality for C++ code in this project is B or C or A. And this is some kind of an incentive to actually improve and compare. And uh, yeah, and team is also quite nice. Wow, so you're using basically every tool you can get your hands on yeah and finding perfect. different issues with each one which is, yeah yeah exactly exactly to keep in well, mind. Uh, i think that in the past uh, especially i i see it for in programmers who started in 90s on windows they do not believe their tools uh but uh, tools all of for men for all the languages not only for super plus for all the languages tools and uh, quality of compilers improved drastically over the last few years. And the cost of issues that are being detected are 
it makes sense to actually look at those issues <laughs> and do not decide, okay, I'm not going to, compiler is definitely wrong and, and because this is not a bug because linearly happens there and later happens something different. So this is not a problem right now. So compiler is wrong. No, so, okay, maybe we can fix this line so compiler does not complain anymore and maybe it will actually improve the, uh, the code quality in here because next person looking at this code, it might be more readable for the next person after that is going to uh, come in here and try to maintain this code. This yeah. solution. I just want to comment on that real quick because, and, and when you said before, um, uh, when you're looking at the static analysis of the warnings and you say, well, this, this definitely is not a bug right now, but if anyone modifies code around this, it could become a bug. That's just such a different attitude than I'm used to hearing. Most people will say, oh, well, you know, stupid static analysis, it gave me a false positive here. And then they, you know, put a comment in to ignore that and they move on with their lives instead of instead of saying, well, wait a minute, what about the future viewer of this code? Is there some way we can make this better and, and improve the, the, the overall state? I, it, sounds, it sounds awesome to me. So I just wanted to comment on that. I think that, that that's, that's a benefit of working on open source projects. Well, mm -hmm. there are no set deadlines and uh, it's more important to, to preserve the high quality of the code than actually deliver on some time because for be for uh, in cloud soft, uh, software there might be other factors like uh, some uh, business timeline which is important to deliver by that time right for, uh, for computer games there are deadlines that cannot be crossed for example okay. uh, but for open source software usually it is much more beneficial to preserve high quality uh, mostly for the sake of maintainers because they are going uh, Contributors that are going are coming and going, right? But uh, maintainers uh, are should be interested about about keeping the quality as high as possible. Uh, and sometimes uh, it might be even uh, mean changing the code. This is a lesson that I learned from Git project. I, I submitted and some of my patches were accepted to the Git. Uh, and uh, the lessons from lesson from there was that uh, my initial version of the code was already okay and it was already acceptable but uh, maintainer asked me to actually rewrite it a little bit to make it a little bit less optimal but there was fewer repetition and uh, if anyone changed that line of code again it was most likely the compiler would be more likely to, 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 to complain Therefore, okay. uh, less uh, workload for for maintainer for the future parties for the next person coming in. Interesting. Yeah, it does seem like the kind of lesson that would largely be learned from large scale open source projects that uh, most people don't have access to. Or in some of the very large open source projects that we might have discussed on this show previously, they tend to be largely maintained by one company with its own goals and ideals and whatever internally. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we talked a lot about you know modernizations you've made and, and some of the things you took out of DOSBox, old features that weren't relevant anymore. Is there anything you've added on, on this version of DOSBox? Oh yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I already talked about the changes that were focused mostly about making the project easier to maintain. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Introduced yeah. CI, uh, introduced uh, testing infrastructure, which we are still building up. That sounds before difficult. We are, before we actually st we start writing the proper set of tests, because previously there were no tests at all, and if you have like nine times nine thousand PC games from eighties and nineties, and you don't have tests at all. And <laughs> yeah, <it's> you, <laughs> every change is, is is very scary, right? There are plenty of people are actually community is great, and plenty of people are doing uh, manual testing and manual verification before each release. But uh, it is much better to have those tests automated, mm -hmm. which is. Having automated tests 
running on three operating systems at the same time, uh, which are easy to deploy and easy to run, is actually not so trivial mm -mm. In, in modern environment, right? Because, uh, for example, uh, G-Test, we are using G-Test. Uh, when the project is used in via Visual Studio, Visual Studio has its own uh, preferred way of running G-Test. And when we have, want to have a code deployable by different Linux distributions, they have their own preferred way of running G-Test. And the same with Mac OS, where G-Test is not available via any repository. Uh, so those kinds of, I will talk about this later, but we solve those kinds of issues by introducing, by using Meson. And it's such mm -hmm. a great build system. I will talk about that. Uh, back to the features. Uh, we started introducing changes that make the project easier to use. Earlier I said that TOSBOX is not so easy to configure. You need to have some experience to actually know how to tweak certain things and why uh, you might have uh, performance issues right now. But after switching one magical option, those issues for this specific game might actually disappear. Uh, so we redesigned defaults because defaults that were there, uh, default settings uh, were designed in early 2000s, right? DOSBox is 20 year old project. Mm -hmm. So some defaults, uh, for example, about uh, how the full screen should behave were completely different in times where the, everyone had, had CRT and uh, resolutions were fixed and there were certain a set of expectations about full screen works in, in uh, on PC. And now, when almost every gamer prefers to have uh, some kind of uh, borderless full screen window, which will not trigger change, uh, mode, uh, mode change on your LCD display. So we started redesigning, uh, redesigning defaults, uh, improving documentation, uh, started work on uh, improving trans existing translations because there are trans right now there is a, some way to, to to translate messages inside the emulator but it does not work so well so uh, about, we start to work on uh, making translations and uh, replacing old translation system with newer one which will solve so many issues once, once it will finally run. And uh, that was also great because uh, the moment we started talking about translations, people, uh, new potential contributors started coming in, oh, I want to do French translation. Oh, I want to do Russian translation. Oh, I want to do uh, Italian translation. So the more people are coming in, the more contributors, the easier it is to, to actually move forward. Because Every contributor is a tester as well, right? Uh, what other features from the, the ones that are kind of... Uh, oh, and other, uh, so we started adding also non-standard DOS shell commands. <laughs> so for example, uh, in Windows and in DOS, uh, there is a command that everyone used on those systems, dear, like to, to display directories. Right. And people who dread command line on Windows, old command line, command prompt, uh, are used to this way of <laughs> displaying, displaying files in the current working directory. But nowadays people are used to typing ls, right? <laughs> because ls used to work, uh, I mean, from Unix times, it works everywhere, basically. Right. In PowerShell nowadays, people just type mm -hmm. ls. It's, in, it's, it's in very muscle memory. Uh, so yeah, we implemented uh, ls, <laughs> nice col nice colored syntax to, to to distinguish between files and directories, which is very important because we are emulating uh, a terminal when you start DOSBox. The default Windows is uh, looks like DOS terminal from 80s, which has 80 columns and 25 uh, rows, right? So right. it's very limited space. So uh, using that space to carefully uh, displaying files and directories and using colors to signify it is such a small thing. And after that, per person after person was contacting me through various forums, thanking me about implementing this feature. 
I don't know how many times I've accidentally typed ls into DOSBox. So I. Uh, yeah. So in DOSBox Edging, it will just display. <laughs> I, I'm, now, now I have to install it. <laughs> nice. OK, so oh. those are small changes about uh, improving usability and bigger changes about uh, implementing features that were usually someone already implemented that like seven years ago and patch is in there somewhere half finished half working or for example working on the own windows and the to linux uh, so we started looking at, the, at those patches and cleaning them up fixing them on another part so they work cross-platform properly uh, and step by step merging sometimes sometimes those features are really big so splitting them into smaller more maintainable uh, pull requests and merging them one by one by one. Uh, and those are those are usually the, the, the selling point with each release, right? So right. when we want to uh, brag about, oh, we have new feature, because when we are going to do a release and we are going to we fix this bug and this bug and this bug, people are not going to care. But ha, ah, we have this new feature. And it's a visible spike in downloads. Funny. Uh, out of those features, oh, which is also again connected to Meson, which we'll, I will talk about later, uh, we uh, implemented uh, one of those patches was built in MIDI, MIDI synthesizer. Uh, of course, not our implementation because MIDI synthesizer is completely uh, other class of software. Okay. Uh, but there is uh, one very very good implementation synthesizer called fluid synth which uh, also had a revival several years ago it used to be also almost abandoned project but new group took over and, and started implementing and, and improving it and now it is really really good uh, so yeah previously uh, i mean in the 90s specifically in the 90s there were many games that used midi music Games sometimes sounded so beautiful, and mm -hmm. there were so so great uh, technical achievements for some of those games using MIDI music. For example, uh, Lucas Art Games used uh, they had uh, they had their own system where music changed uh, dynamically based on the uh, situation on the screen. So this is a feature that we have even in modern games right now. But their implementation was based on MIDI, and this music was automatically generated during the gameplay. And it works so much better than what we have in modern games right now. <laughs> uh, authentically, it is uh, sometimes so much fun to run some old game that you remember from childhood, and, and uh, but to turn on MIDI music for this game, and uh, it is completely can change the experience. Hmm. Before uh, earlier, before we uh, integrated fluid synth, setting up MIDI music was quite painful because right. uh, mm -hmm. synthesizer need to be. Some people use still even now uh, physical synthesizers, like keyboards or stuff like that, and we're uh, connecting those box to those. Uh, but majority of people just try uh, used. Uh, software synthesizers like fluid synth or timidity or some other ones um, i think there is official roland's software synthesizer but on windows i don't know how, well, how, how good is it it is but we have great open source alternatives uh, but it was a little bit, bit painful to set it up right because every operating system exposes uh, midi devices in a different way completely mm. different way different APIs are used, uh, different configuration is required, it was paint. Right now it is integrated into the uh, into the emulator itself to those bots, so it's much easier. Right. I, think we, to pick this I think we're starting to maybe run a little bit low on time. Is there anything else you wanted to, to share before we start to yeah. close it out? Yeah, Meson. Meson, uh, ah. when we started, the, in the very beginning, the project was quite old. Right? Twenty years mm -hmm. of, of, of maintaining the same the same two build systems. So there is one build system for Windows, which is old Visual, old Visual Studio based, not new one. Does not work in new Visual Studio. <laughs> uh, 
but but it was there and uh, auto tools based build system which works everywhere else but it was painful to use painful right. to uh, painful to integrate every new tool every new uh, painful to very painful to integrate the gts to add compilation flags to integrate our own tools or scripts inside it was very and yeah so uh, i did some prodding here and there uh, checked several different uh, build systems uh, and in the end i decided okay i will compare cmake and meson and decide on one of the two i had some experience with cmake already from the previous job so i kind of knew what to expect from cmake and Amazon, I was learning from scratch. Hmm. And I must say, Amazon uh, exceeded all my expectations. Awesome. I was completely prepared that uh, building, setting up another build system for another project is going to be painful again. And there will be a lot of razor blades hiding somewhere and a lot of pain points. And hmm. it turns out the Amazon is uh, such well-crafted and carefully uh, designed system that it was a pleasure to use. And I am awesome. honestly, honestly, a little bit surprised that modern CMake is fine. And there are a lot of projects which prefer to use modern CMake. And honestly, I do not understand why. <laughs> Meson is, uh, not only Meson is great as a tool, it's also very uh, re reliably and well it's well maintained. It uh, is uh, improving very fast and community is great, it's extremely cool. helpful. So we had, we had questions about, uh, I mean, we had questions towards uh, the community about certain features or certain edge cases that we were experiencing and they were always helpful and uh, into pointing us to, 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 to correct uh, technical decision. And yeah, well, I think I wanted one to purchase in Mason in return, of course. And uh, Mason also has a feature uh, called uh, Mason Wraps, which is about uh, integrating external dependencies, uh, which can be configured by, per build, per operating system that you use. It's, it, it's up to the user and developer. And yeah, we turned out, it uh, turns out that there were some projects missing in Rob, so I started packaging them, uh, which helped us. In turn, it made, gave us the connection to uh, other related open source projects. So it's easier for us to cooperate right now with FluidSynth or MT32 ammo project, which is uh, a little bit related to those books. Uh, I very recommend Mason wholeheartedly. <laughs> it's great. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today, Patrick. Uh, thank you for uh, telling us all about the, the work you've done to kind of modernize DOSBox. Uh, and, and where can listeners go and, and check out the project, maybe if they're interested in contributing? <clears throat> DOSBoxstaging.github.io. Okay. Uh, with dash dosbox dash staging dot github dot io, or the, there are links in there for for github and for discord. We have quite uh, active discord community, and uh, any questions can be asked in there. Also on Reddit, uh, subreddit r dosbox, uh, people are oh, nice. there as well. Okay, thanks for coming on, Patrick. Thanks a lot. That was great. Thanks for asking.